I guess the thing that hasn't changed that I wish would change and needs to change is the issue of stigma. Um, I think there's a lot more dialogue about specific pathogens like HPV. People at least know chlamydia is not a flower. I don't know if you remember those old posters that said chlamydia is not a flower. People at least talk about the terms. They see the words in newspapers, etc. But there's still incredible amount of stigma, I think, regarding provision of STD care. These things are, these issues are not normalized for us. They're not, um, they're very stigmatized. But I think the kind of sexualization of everything in culture uh, has made them more urgent and you see a lot more sex and sexuality in television shows in prime time in places that you didn't see it before but the STD rates have not gone down and our ability to talk about them probably normally and comfortably as a nation has not been affected. At the beginning I was the only one talking about sexually transmitted diseases and even my friends were laughing because they were saying that uh, I was um, one of the, of the people that will turn red or flush when talking about sex. And now I was like the, the women of the sexually transmitted diseases. And so I think it, it was, for me, it was, it was challenging. The fa and it was amazing that nobody was talking about something that was so common, so frequent, and we were not teaching medical school, medical students or midwives or, or anybody in the health sector. And it was there. And, um, and, and it was... On the, other, on the other hand, it was challenging because nobody wanted to talk about that. It was kind of dirty, you know, the venereal diseases. We live in a world where stigma and discrimination continue to hinder access to services and where laws continue to marginalize vulnerable key populations, such as men who have sex with men within my own region of Usti, Africa. When I, I go to a cocktail party and I tell people what I do, they're like, oh, STDs. It's like a complete conversation stopper. Nobody wants to ask you any questions after that. I remember distinctly being uh, at a party um, with a lot in, uh, in a Virginia suburb where it was Christmas time and I had just come home from training on the other side of the country and uh, we were circulating. And people said, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm... Uh, training in infectious diseases, at which time my mother, who was about a foot shorter than me, would step up and say, oh, he's not only training in infectious diseases, he's training in sexually transmitted diseases. So if you have any questions about herpes or anything else, I'll just step aside and let you talk. And it was, uh, she obviously took a lot of pleasure in doing that, uh, but it was also uh, quite a, uh, it, got me thinking about what I do and why I do it. And, and, and ultimately it led me to realize that uh, one of the problems we have in controlling these important problems for our society and for the world uh, is that people are reticent to talk about them. Uh, and uh, I think, again, as my career has progressed, I've learned that that reticence to talk about sex sexuality, STDs, uh, is perhaps our biggest barrier to addressing them. The Surgeon General's call to action to promote sexual health and responsible sexual behavior was among other things an attempt to really get the American people to be outspoken and comfortable talking about sexual behavior um, and to start as early as possible so that young people beginning with children would understand their sexuality. And, um, and how to promote sexual health and responsible sexual behavior. But we still, unfortunately, are too hesitant to talk about this topic, uh, whether at home or in school, and yet it's a part of the body, just like any other part of the body. So, and yet it has the potential to do great harm if we don't become more outspoken and honest about it. There have been times when there was a lot easier conversation about adolescent sexuality, sexual behavior, and the STDs that they get. There have been other times when that conversation has been much more restricted. It's an area where there's a lot of social controversy about adolescent sex, about talking to adolescents about sex, about talking about STI prevention, about safe sex. I think you have to be committed to the possibility that there will be strong voices against this work. I think that will never go away. 
and I think the commitment is embrace the, the gray area. Learn to live with that kind of ambiguity, the kinds of things that make adolescence entrancing to work with is the fact that it's a moving target. And today's adolescent will be different tomorrow or next week. Part of the health disparities with STDs has to do with poverty and ignorance and stigma and things that are so difficult to touch. But people are talking about that now and I, I'm seeing more and more complex interventions that are able to, to affect change because they're getting at the root causes rather than just putting a Band-Aid on it. So I think if we can take a positive and empowering um, approach to it and actually try and work with the populations we're trying to reach um, to empower them um, and, and also reach them in ways that are more meaningful to them because I think if we're, if we're honest about why people have sex, it's because there are lots of good, good things about it too and um, sort of approach them more holistically as, as humans who don't think about disease, you know, like we do eight, eight to eight plus hours a day.